All right, now Acts 21, you may not have caught this as you were uh, reading through the passage. Obviously, Paul is um, traveling and, uh, you know, he's saying goodbye. He's saying farewell to some people as he's going to travel into Jerusalem, knowing the things that are going to befall him at Jerusalem. And then he arrives at Jerusalem and you see some of the events unfold. You know, we're getting into the later Acts, into the later chapters of Acts. And, uh, you know, these are the less familiar chapters because like with any book of the Bible, maybe you start reading it, but you get to the end of it less often. You know, so people may be familiar with Genesis 1. They're not so familiar with Genesis 49 and Genesis 50. So people are not so familiar with the things that happened in Acts 21 and, and myself included, you know, because you, you're sort of familiar with some of the more famous passages in Acts that we've gone through as we're going through this study. But the theme I found in this chapter is how we make difficult decisions. And, you know, Paul here in this chapter, you may not have realised, made two decisions that were quite difficult. And difficult meaning it's not so clear what was the right thing to do. And uh, when we come across a difficult decision, sometimes we, have to, we won't all agree on what the decision is, that is made. But ultimately, we need to live with the consequences. We need to trust God, uh, that God's will is done. And, uh, you know, sometimes we make the right decisions. Sometimes we make the wrong decisions. Uh, but we can learn in hindsight uh, and gain some experience. So this is what we're seeing here in Acts 21. So let's, let's go through it and we're going to see the two decisions that Paul makes. One, I believe, was the right decision. And the other, I believe, was the wrong decision. Uh, so let's, go, let's start in Acts 21. And we'll, as we go through the passage again, I'll just uh, explain some things and, and note some things as we go through it. So the first part of Acts 21 is just some additional missionary journey. So I, don't, I won't spend so much, so much time there, but he's traveling, and you know, based on the <coughs> language that is being used, Luke is in the company with Paul as he's traveling. So they go to Coaz, they go to Rhodes, Patara, finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, went aboard, and I'll, and I'll skip over some of this for sake of time. We get to verse 4, and it says here, In finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now, I don't believe here that the Holy Spirit is telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. It's saying here through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So what I believe is happening here, because Paul mentions in Acts 20, and we'll go there in a second, that there are many times throughout his ministry that the Holy Ghost told him when he goes back to Jerusalem, these things are going to befall him. So I don't think what is happening here in verse 4 is that the Holy Spirit is telling him not to go. I think the Holy Spirit has revealed also, as he has to many other of the disciples along the way, that there is great danger that will, will, that, that will befall Paul in Jerusalem, and they are simply telling him to, to not go. Their advice to him is, hey, you will, will, will be persecuted, you will potentially die at Jerusalem, don't go. Um, look in Acts 20. Verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost, look at this, witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So what we're seeing here in Acts 21 is just an example being recounted of this thing actually happening. But this is actually happening all throughout Paul's ministry, that people are telling him, this is what's going to happen when you go back to Jerusalem. And, you know, it's not necessarily, um, you know, that the Holy Spirit is discouraging him from going. It's just making known to him what will happen to him as he goes and does this for God. He says here in Acts 20, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might, that, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So, let's continue, and I'll make a few points later. <clears throat> Acts 20, 
25, And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So you see how Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem. He didn't know what would happen to him there, just knowing that he would be in prison, that he would suffer persecution. And he didn't know even if he would leave. He's assuming that when he goes there, that's where his life will likely be ended. Acts 21, And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. So this is when he's leaving now, you know, where he was, where he met these disciples, and he's about to go to Caesarea where he meets Philip the Evangelist. But notice here as they see Paul off, they don't, it's not just the men that are seeing Paul off. They're seeing them off with the wives and children. So this is quite a public farewell to Paul, but it also shows, you know, that Paul, Paul, Paul's impact on the people there, that when they see Paul off, it's not just some private farewell. It's actually everybody with their families are going to see Paul off at the shore and they go there and there's a public time of prayer as well as they kneel down on the shore and pray. So it just, it just shows here in Acts 21 the love that the people had for Paul, that they're even bringing their wives and their children along to farewell him. And when, we had, when he had taken our leave, one of another, we took ship, returned home again. And when we had finished, of course, retire, we came to uh, Telemus and, and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. <clears throat> and the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed, came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Now, I, I believe, I, I didn't have the verse here in my notes, but I believe that after, we, we know who... Philip the evangelist is. Philip <coughs> was one of the seven early deacons. When we went through Acts chapter 6, there was seven deacons that were appointed to help with the ministration of the church. Philip was one of them. And we learn about some of the great works that Philip did in Acts chapter 8, right? When he went, he's preaching the gospel. And we all know the story of the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And what happened there? He baptized the Ethiopian eunuch and then he went on his way. So it turns out that he went to Caesarea and actually stayed at Caesarea because this is where he lives with his family. So it says here, We entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four dirt daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. <clears throat> so, one, so a couple of things it shows here. That Philip was known as a preacher of the gospel. That Luke here, when he acknowledges that we came to Philip's house, he's known as Philip the Evangelist. Isn't that a great title to have? That you would be known as somebody who's a preacher of the gospel. Maybe in God's eyes, you know, like Luke here is acknowledging Philip, that he's recognized as Philip the Evangelist. He wasn't Philip the deacon. Isn't that interesting? So even though his office was the office of a deacon, that the office might be the office of a bishop, you know, you may be, you know, in your role at work, uh, whatever you are, whatever your, your role is, you know? So everyone has their role. But what is your identity in the eyes of God? You know, it's like here, Philip was a deacon, but yet when he is acknowledged here in Acts 21, he's Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven, and abode with him. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So not only is he recognized as an evangelist, but it shows here that he actually set a good example and met the requirements as outlined in 1 Timothy 3 of a deacon, that he was ruling his house well. He was obviously married because he had four daughters, but not only that, his four daughters were virgins. So what does that mean? So his daughters were chaste. He was ruling his house well. He had raised his daughters well to live a pure and chaste life. Not only that, which did prophesy. These daughters were women who were knowledgeable in God's word. So it shows that he was teaching his family the word of God. He was raising his children in, in the ways of God to the point where his, his daughters were able to preach the word of God. Now, we're not talking about preaching in church because the Bible says that women should keep silence in the churches, right? They should learn in silence. But that doesn't stop women 
from preaching God's word. Because not all preaching is done from the pulpit. Right? When we go out and we preach the gospel, that's preaching God's word. That's prophesying. And you know what? In order to preach God's word, you've got to know God's word. And that's what we see here. Right? These four daughters, the virgins, which did prophesy. Now, here's the requirements in 1 Timothy 3. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, not ruling their children and their own house as well. So notice that the requirement for a deacon is the same as a bishop. So, but in some churches, the requirements only apply to the bishop. Right? If you want to be a pastor, then you rule, you know, your family has to be in order, your children have to be in order. But in churches nowadays, who are the deacons? It's just whoever has money. Right? They're like the investors in the church. Right? Or just the people that have just been in there for a long time. Maybe the people that are more popular in church. But, you know, are we, when, when deacons are elected in some churches where they run them democratically rather than by appointment, how it should be, when deacons are elected rather than appointed, then it's a popularity contest, right? So then who is judging whether they are ruling their children in their own house as well? And oftentimes in churches, the deacons don't have their family because they're just people, they're just administrators in the church or they're just, you know, on this board, they're sitting on this board, but they are not always under the same scrutiny as the pastors are, as the bishops are, but they should be, right? The deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. So just like a man that is divorced, right, would disqualify him from being a bishop, a deacon that is divorced, also should be disqualified from being a deacon. A deacon that does not have children would also be disqualified from being a deacon. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Philip is like the textbook example of these qualifications as a deacon. And hey, this, this is something all men should strive for. You know, no matter what your role is in the world, what your work role is, are you seen in the eyes of God as a man of God, as an evangelist, somebody who is striving even to these qualifications, even if you don't one day be a deacon, aren't one day a deacon or a bishop? <clears throat> Let's continue, Acts 21.10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus, so this is now the second, a second example of this, of this thing that Paul is saying in Acts 20, that the Holy Ghost is witnessing in every city that bonds and affliction, afflictions abide him in Judea. Now you've got this prophet named Agabus. What does Agabus do? When he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, right? So he takes Paul's garment, binds his own hands and feet, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth, owneth this good and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here is where the Holy Ghost is actually saying something. But notice the Holy Ghost is not saying don't go to Jerusalem. The Holy Ghost is just saying when you go to Jerusalem, this is what is going to happen. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place <coughs> besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. So Notice here, Paul is told by disciples at another place, and probably at many places along, this is what's going to happen in Jerusalem, you shouldn't go, right? That's, that's the counsel to him. And here also, to the point, even, look here, he says, when we heard these things, both we, who's the we that's referring to? That's referring to Luke. So even to the point where Luke is saying, you know what, Paul, I don't think this is a good idea. You know, you go to Jerusalem. And then it says here, and they that are of that place. Who are they that are of that place? Philip was there. <clears throat> so even Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven, saying, you know, Paul, maybe you shouldn't go there. You know, let, you should stay here. Like, I just, what, what are they saying? They don't think it's worth it. They're, make, they're making the judgment call. This is dangerous. This may not be God's will for you. But Paul was convinced that it was God's will for him to go there. This is why he responds the way he does. He says, then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep? Look at that, they're begging him with tears. Don't go. 
you know, probably because they know that he's going to die. Like, we, we don't want to lose you, you know. Um, you know, it makes me think of, you know, <clears throat> uh, when, you, when you read about martyrs in the days and, you know, there's the, even the song we sang, you know, we've heard the, the Macedonian call. As I understand, I, I may be mixing up stories, that, you know, there's a story of people that sold themselves into slavery because somebody had like set up an island and he didn't, he hated the gospel, didn't want anyone, the gospel coming to this island and he had all these slaves on this island and, and that island was blocked off from the gospel. But the, sto the story goes, and I don't know all the details, but I've heard the story, that these evangelists that, was, that, that loved these people so much sold themselves into slavery and went over knowing that they may never come back, you know? And I think the, uh, I can't remember what the, 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 I don't know if it was the Macedonia call, it was something else. But as they left on that ship, going to this island, perhaps never to return, they were heard saying, let the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. So this is kind of what's happening here. Like Paul is determined to, to go to Jerusalem because because he loves his brethren. So, so, but, but people are weeping, knowing that this is the last time they're going to see Paul. You're going to die at Jerusalem. And he says, Here, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? Why is his heart breaking? Because obviously he loves the people that are giving him advice. He would, he would want their blessing. Right? He would want their encouragement. But the fact that they're discouraging him from doing something that he believes is God's will, you know, obviously he's showing here that these people are important to us. For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. So this, this situation reminds me a lot of even Jesus' situation. So what, I, what I'm trying to get at here, and we're sort of getting to this lesson, is you know, sometimes God's will is not that clear people have different opinions on what is the right thing to do and just because there is a danger or there is a contention over what is the right thing to do doesn't necessarily mean that it's not God's will if it's not clearly contrary to something in the Bible of the will of God I mean even Jesus coming and going to the cross you know even his disciples said to him hey I don't think you should do this look at what uh, Peter says to Jesus here in Matthew 16, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offence unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So, <clears throat> so, the lesson here is danger and contrary opinion do not necessarily mean a decision is not God's will. Right? Some decisions are based on your own convictions and what God will want you to do, but it needs to always align with God's will. And here, you know, you can use, I mean, think about it in your own life. Sometimes there are decisions where you say, I'm going ahead with this, whether it's a financial decision, whether it's a spiritual decision. And it's not always, it's not necessarily a question of whether this is sinful or not to do, right? This is a question of conviction. What do you believe God would have you to do with your life? And just because there, there is a danger, just because there is contrary opinion, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not God's will. Like we see here, he went to Jerusalem, but ultimately he has to live with the consequences of what happens. And ultimately, like what we see here at the end of Acts 21, 14, and when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. So even, they, even though we may not always agree on what is the right thing to do and what is the best thing to do in every decision in our lives we can all agree that we want God's will to be done and we want God God to be glorified so 
That was the first decision in this chapter, right? The decision to return to Jerusalem. And I believe Paul made the right decision because he had that conviction, he had that love for his people. And I think it would have been wrong for him to go against his conscience of what he believed God wanted him to do with his life, even though it was dangerous, right? So this wasn't a question of, is this the right thing to do? They, they were thinking, well, it was dangerous and they were just discouraging him from going. Now, what was the second decision that he made? So once he arrives at Jerusalem, let's have a look at what happened. But number two is conforming to traditions. Conforming to traditions. Acts 21, 15. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manasseh of Cyprus. So he's traveling also. Obviously, he's got a companion of people that he's traveling with. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. So if you remember back previously in Acts, when he went to Jerusalem to figure out the answer to a dispute over whether the Gentiles needed to be circumcised or not, James was the one that gave the suggestion, as he mentions in this chapter, that they were only to keep certain things. <coughs> so James is one of the prominent figures within the early church <coughs> at Jerusalem. But that doesn't mean that James always has the correct judgments because it seems here that even after a long time returning back to Jerusalem, there hasn't been a, there hasn't been a stand taken against all these Mosaic laws, against all the Judaizers. In fact, you know, they're quite at peace with all the Judaizers. So the question is, why at Jerusalem are they so at peace with all these Zionist, you know, Judaizers that are trying to like, you know, keep all the laws, still performing sacrifices, where Paul, wherever he goes, teaching the truth of the gospel, is being persecuted by these Jews? It's because the church in Jerusalem is starting to compromise. They're starting to compromise too much to the point where they are catering to these people that are holding to these traditions and to the point where we can see their reaction to when Paul is here they, they possibly don't even understand, you know, the reason why these things are done away. And, you know, this was an opportunity for them to teach them these things through Paul, but yet they did the politically expedient thing and to keep everyone at peace. So Paul talks about, in verse 18, the many works that they're doing, the many people that they're getting saved, Right? And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So it almost sounds here, you know, the way I read it, it's almost like justifying that, hey, well, they're all saved, so what does it matter if they're still zealous about all these laws that should be done away and were a shadow of things to come, even though Jesus has come? But... They are compromising and playing in to the demands of these people, these Jews, with a weak faith. that They don't want to give up these practices. And they are informed of thee. So he knows that they don't like what Paul is teaching. That thou teachest all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses. And obviously this is a mischaracterization, right? Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So that is true. Right? So he's telling them they shouldn't be circumcised and that these things are a shadow of things to come, like he teaches in Colossians and like he teaches in Hebrews. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. So notice here, I just want you to take a mental note here, that there would have been the opportunity to address this multitude. Right, so when Paul came, everyone's going to know, hey, Paul's here, hey, isn't that that guy? You know, he could have addressed the multitude and that could have been a great test, you know, ex explanation to say, this is why, you know, to explain, this is why I'm telling the Gentiles these things. No, you've got this wrong. No, you've got this right. You know, and th this is how it should work, to exhort the people and to teach them. But instead of that, the suggestion from James is to just keep up appearances. Do therefore this that which we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Now what is this vow? This is likely the Nazarite vow. Take them 
and purify themselves, purify, purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou walkest also, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So you see what he's saying here? He's saying, well, you haven't even had a Nazarite vow, but just pretend like you have, so you can be cleansed with them and shave your head with them and will offer the offering, you know, the sin offering, which is what it is, as well, so they don't think you're speaking against these, these law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written, and then this is where he says, hey, these are the things that they told the Gentiles to keep. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify an accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So this vow that he's referring to, that they are still keeping these laws in the Old Testament, the Nazarite vow. It says here, this is the law of the Nazarite when the days of his separation are fulfilled. He shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, look at this, for a sin offering. So you see these sacrifices that they're doing. This is just not giving something to God, like an offering to God. They are still following the practices of sacrificing animals for a sin offering. Right? But the sin offering, these things are all done away. Why? Because they were accomplished in Jesus Christ. So I, I, I won't go through all this for sake of time, but this is the Nazarite, but this is what's happening here. Now Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 makes it very clear, and this is Paul writing here, right? Hebrews. That all these things were a shadow of things to come. Right, so Paul knows that these things no longer apply. Right? But, you know, he has compromise to the point where I don't think it's any expedient anymore. So for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worship is once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Right? So he's saying that the fact that these sacrifices continue this is why it proves that those sacrifices can't take away sins. Because if they could take away sins, those offerings would stop. But this is why they have stopped. Because the offering that has taken away sins has come. For in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. So he's saying he doesn't want these sacrifices because they were just symbolic. But there is a real body that's coming that's referring to Jesus Christ. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. So Paul knows this. This is his preaching, right? This is his teaching. But why was he compelled to compromise? It's not that Paul did not have good reason to. What did he desire? He desired unity between the Jew and Gentile, which is why he was willing to go along with James's suggestions of them not eating food sacrificed to idols and stay. some of them obviously good, some of them were just, hey, well, why are they keeping some of these Old Testament laws? But it was to keep the peace between Jew and Gentile. And here, part of the reason why he's so willing to compromise is because he loves his brethren so much. See, so it wasn't that it was poorly intention, it was bad intention, it was good intentions. But sometimes good intentions are not good enough to, to decide what is the right thing to do. Romans 9, this is Paul saying here, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continu continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed for Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So Paul could easily justify in his mind, you know, I want these people to be saved. I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. I want unity. This is, not, this is just symbolic. 
This is nothing, this is not necessarily sinful in and of itself. This could be lawful, but then the question is, is it expedient? Like he talks about in 1 Corinthians 9. So I won't go over this for sake of time, but you know the principle here that, hey, not all things are expedient. All things might be lawful. And in 1 Corinthians 9, we see Paul's desire to want to conform to different cultures in order to win them. And this is what he's doing here in Jerusalem. And in 1 Corinthians 10, we see the justification that, hey, well, these things aren't necessarily sinful. I'm not sinning against God. But the question is, is it expedient? Is it right for him to do? So this is where we're left with the question, right? Was it right? Was it right for Paul to do what he did? Was it right for him to comply and just go along and pretend like he thought that these things were okay, even though he was known for teaching that these things were done away? Now, I believe, my opinion is, because there is a, there is a, there is a difference of opinion here. Right? There are mixed opinions on whether Paul did the right thing and whether it was all right for him to comply here or whether it was the wrong thing. My opinion is that he didn't do the right thing because I think it compromised the truth of the gospel to the point where Jerusalem was offering sin offerings, right? To, you know, the, the whole idea of the sin offering was to remind us of Jesus Christ. But if Jesus Christ is come, if the offering for sin has been done, why then are they still continuing in the purpose that those offerings were to, to remind them that the sin had not been purged, like we read about in Hebrews 10. So, to me, it's similar to Christians baptising their infant children to please their Orthodox or Catholic parents. So they may say, well, you know, baptism, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really, you know, it's just getting wet, it's not going to hurt them. But the question is, hey, it may not be sinful in and of itself to wet a child, right? But what does that thing represent? What is it expedient? Are you playing in to the fact that people do believe these things? They do believe in baptismal regeneration. These Jews do believe, you know, some of them do believe that they're still required to be circumcised, to be saved, still required to do these sacrifices to be saved. So, so what is at stake? And I believe here Paul made the wrong decision. Now, why do I believe that? So my third point is, you know, hindsight is 2020. Hindsight is 2020. You know, it's easy for us to sit here and look at the decisions Paul made and said, we would have made a different decision. But not being in that situation at the time, would we have? So I'm not saying that necessarily, I, you know, this is not a claim that I'm more spiritual than Paul. I would have done the right thing in Paul's situation. I'm just saying as we learn from this scenario, I believe in this chapter what God is showing to us is Paul made a difficult decision, but he made the right decision was to go to Jerusalem for the love to preach the gospel. But when he got to Jerusalem, he made a wrong decision, which was to play in to their traditions as opposed to take the stand and explain what they were persecuting him about. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's because when he went to Jerusalem, the playing in to, to what they expected didn't stop them from persecuting him anyway. Right? Look, Acts 21, when the seven days were almost ended. So he's not even through the Nazarite. So he's waiting to be cleansed. He's probably shaved his head. He's waiting seven days. The, the Nazarite vow and all the things that he had to do hadn't even finished yet. So the days were almost ended. The Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. So you see, he tried to appease his violent opposition. But why? You know, why do something to appease the violent opposition when they're not going to accept what you're doing anyway? I mean, they're saying, they come, they see him going through that. Their first thought is not like James said, oh, hey, look, he, he, he actually isn't, you know, against these traditions. No, they're like, hey, there he is. There's the man. 
And this is why when, when you have the violent opposition, no matter what you do to try and appease them, you're not going to appease them, so why even bother trying to appease them? It, 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 it makes me... It's similar to today on social media and in politics where you have prominent figures trying to cater to the left, trying to cater to this cancel culture. And no matter what they do, they don't please them. So if that's the case, why try and please them? Why not confront that difference? So he could have went to Jerusalem and confronted the difference with the truth, right? Rather than compromising and not actually achieving what they wanted to achieve anyway, which was convincing them that they, he wasn't as bad as they thought he was. So they stirred up the people, crying out, men of Israel, help, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks also into the temple and polluted this holy place. So did Paul actually do that? No, they had just assumed because he was traveling with an Ephesian, Trophimus, he must have brought him into the temple. So you see how, why should have Paul tried to cater to the conviction, to the, to the, to the desires of this violent opposition when he should have just confronted them with the truth rather than tried to appease them. This is why I think he, he, did, he made the wrong decision here. So they even assumed things that weren't true. Right? They assumed, oh, Trophimus, yeah, they must have like just defiled the temple or just brought them into the temple. Why even cater in to these to people that are almost, uh, you know, I don't even know, this is not technically a racial divide, but this cultural divide, where they're still trying to divide Jew and Gentile. And yet, why are the people in Jerusalem still at peace with this violent crowd that are, you know, violent towards Paul when they acknowledge that Paul is teaching the truth? You see how there's this compromise that's going on and they shouldn't have compromised. Paul should have went there and like he's withstood Peter to the face, you know, he didn't do the same. He didn't, you know, uh, go there, stand on the truth of God's word, which is probably what God would, would have wanted him to do, and then taking the opportunity when they came together to preach to them. So now it didn't, it didn't work, right? They still were out for blood. All the city was moved. The people ran together. They took Paul, drew him out of the temple. Fought, so this, remember, this is, this is even before he's able to even, he's going through that Nazarite cleansing, right? Where they're going to offer a sin offering. You know, maybe this is God's way of showing that he didn't want him to take part in that sin offering. Doesn't even let him finish <laughs> these things that he was going to do. Drew him out. And as they went about to kill him, you see, so these people, they're not interested in what Paul had to say. You know, they're not in, they, they just want him dead. Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So this is now the Romans authorities realizing, oh, there's this, you know, there's this conflict going on the streets. You know, the police are now coming out to, 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 take, to, to put an end to this. Who immediately took soldiers <coughs> and centurions, so these are the Roman-like police, ran down unto them, and when they saw the chief captains and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. So this reminds me of the same sort of scenes where there's like a gang violence beating up this person, and then when the sirens come blazing, they're like, they all scatter, right? Because they don't want to be arrested. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him, look at this, to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. So you see here the influence that these violent, it's like the violent left today. Why is everyone catering to them? You know, it's not only like the politicians and the people, but even like the law enforcement is catering to them. It, it reminds me of the protest that Avi Yemeni goes to. Like he goes in, he has the right to be there, he has freedom of speech, but then when he goes there, he's the one getting arrested. So it's like here, Paul's the one getting beaten up by this, by this violent Jewish crowd and yet when the Romans go there, who do they appease? The violent crowd, rather than Paul. Why are they arresting Paul? Why is he in chains? He's half beaten up. You see, later on, he can't even walk up the stairs on his own. Why are they putting him in chains? Why? Because they're trying to appease these people. You know, and this is why I'm saying Paul should not have done this. Paul should have taken the stand because he's, he's gonna get, he got beaten up anyway. Some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, tumult this is the, 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 the captain, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. 
And when he came upon the stairs, so it was, look at this, that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. See how, how badly he was beaten up? He can't even walk up the stairs on his own. He's carried up the stairs by the soldiers. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, away with him. That's how badly Paul was beaten by these people. Remember, they wanted to kill him. It was just the captain came and saved his life. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the, unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian? So, so this, obviously, he has no idea who Paul is, right? So this verse is just, he has no idea who Paul is and why they're upset with him. They think that they're upset with him because he's this other Egyptian. But Paul clarifies, no, I'm not that Egyptian. He says who he is. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. When there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Now, I just want you to think about this situation. And, you know, as many times in Acts where we've reflected on Paul's love for his brethren. And I just think this is another example where it's just like, oh man, like how does Paul love these people so much? Because think about it. Is your first thought after you are violently beaten by a crowd of people to the point where you can't even walk up some stairs to go, wait a second, I want to tell them about, you know, the gospel and about why I'm here and things like that. This is Paul's first thought. So the next chapter is what he says to them. He recounts how Jesus, you know, and we're going to go into that next time we go into Acts 22. But man, what a love Paul had for his brethren. Uh, and you know, would to God that we would emulate that sort of love, that desire, that burden for the lost that we have for the people that we know. I mean, this is somebody to emulate. Paul obviously is emulating Jesus Christ, Jesus knowing the suffering he was going to go through, but knew that was the will of God. Not my will, my will, but thou be done. That's, that's, that was Paul's mindset. And this is why I want to show you Luke. But, you know, just for sake of time, I, I won't go through all these verses. But, you know, that was Jesus' mindset as well. Not my will, but thou be done. But also the love of Paul that even immediately after being beaten up by these people, he still musters up the strength to say, look, let's address them and tell them uh, what I want them to hear. So, so why do I think, this is the, this is the passage, I, I won't go through it for the sake of time, I'll probably put in a lot of these scriptures that I want to share with you because they're, re they're relevant, but they're quite well known. You know, Luke 6 is about you know, loving your enemies, blessing them that curse you, praying for them which despitefully use you, and being, you know, being that example. And Jesus was that example, and we see Paul being that example here now. So that's why I think the main point of this chapter is that there are these difficult decisions being made. And in our life, we have these difficult decisions, and it's not always easy to know what the right thing to do is, but sometimes we have to follow our convictions of what we believe is the right thing to do by God when it's not clear that this is a right, sinful or not, you know? So it's not saying that don't listen to counsel. It's not saying don't take into account the consequences. But that shouldn't stop you from doing what you believe is the will of God for your life. And that is personal to each person. Paul was going to go to Jerusalem. But the second decision, which was to cater to this crowd, I don't think he should have. See, like, he had the opportunity now, after this, uh, whatever the word, word is, this tumult, to address the crowd. But he would have had that opportunity before, because remember, James said to him, hey, it must needs that they're going to come together and they're going to hear of thee. Right? So either way, he got to this same point. But, you know, I just think he got to this point the wrong way. Uh, but... You know, it's easy to sit back and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we would have done the right thing in that situation. I would have done the right thing in that situation. We're just going back and seeing what, because it's easy to sit back and say what you would have done after the fact, <laughs> right? But you know what? It's, it's encouraging to know 
that even the best of men are men at best. You know, you've heard that saying? So it's encouraging to know that, you know, if Paul can also make the wrong decision, live with the consequences and grow from it, hey, even in our life, sometimes we make the wrong decisions, but we can grow from it. You know, it's not, it's not we, shouldn't, we shouldn't beat ourselves up. I mean, he here, he's beaten up physically, <laughs> right? But we shouldn't beat ourselves up over wrong past decisions. You know, we just learn from them, you know, as we're learning from Paul's life, and we pray um, for wisdom with future decisions. So just in conclusion, <coughs> <coughs> what are some of the lessons we can take away from Acts 21? Danger and contrary opinion do not necessarily mean a decision is not God's will. Right? Some decisions are based on your own convictions. We, don't, we want to make sure that they align with God's word, that they're not sinful. But, you know, where it can be most applicable, because when we, think, when we think about big decisions in our life, oftentimes big decisions are selfish, self-centered. Where am I going to work? You know, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to live? This financial decision, that financial decision. But I want you to think of this in the context of what Paul is doing and why I think Paul made the right decision. Because Paul is, is not making a selfish decision. He is making a decision to do something great for God, to do something great with his life. And that is with, not without its risks. So... You know, you, I hope that you have plans for your life where you want to do great things for God. And there may come a time when people are saying, I think you're a bit radical. I think you're not doing the right thing. I don't think that's going to bode well here, blah, 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 like the people were here. And they, were, they weren't necessarily people just trying to pull him down. They loved him. You know, they were beseeching him with tears. But don't let danger... Don't let contrary opinion and fear stop you from doing great things for God. That's one thing I want you to take away. Another thing is, good intentions can lead us to compromise further than is expedient. So just beware that, you know, just because all things are lawful, don't just compromise to the point where it's expedient. You know, like I often hear... You know, I often hear the, 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 what Christians do is that they're going to go, you know, to the clubs with their friends and they're going to go out to all these worldly, ungodly places because they're going to be a light in that dark place. Hey, all things may be lawful, but are all things expedient? You know, like, you've got to think about the, the pros and the cons and same here with Paul. Like, did the pros outweigh the cons in terms of him complying to the point where his testimony was being you know, less effective to those that he was trying to reach. Number three, another thing we learn from this chapter is don't try to please the violent opposition. They're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt anyway. So don't be a people pleaser where you just give up, you know, what you're standing for. There are some people in this world, like we see on social media, you're just not going to please them. So don't even try. And number four, like we said in the last point, don't beat yourself up over wrong decisions. Just learn from them as we're learning from Paul's life and just pray for wisdom you know, in future decisions. It's not always easy to make the right decision, but you know, as long as you're learning, you're asking for wisdom, you're growing, and we can always be moving forward. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the... Uh, life of Paul, just, uh, uh, Lord, just, uh, just what a love he has for his, his people. Uh, what boldness. But, you know, even the men, best of men are men at best. And, Lord, whether we take encouragement from the right things Paul does or we take encouragement from the wrong things he does, we thank you, Lord, that we have him as an example to us. So we thank you for your word, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.